Welcome to the episode of Just More Fix. This is James. With me in this episode is Lacey. Hey. You can find us online at justmorefix.com or on Twitter at Just for More Fix. If you like us, you can support us at Patreon and you can give us a rating and review at iTunes or wherever you find us at. In this episode, we're going to talk about improving your fantasy games with NPCs. And now, it's time to get our gaming fix. I'm Stargate Pioneer. I'm Haley. And I'm Lauren from Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. A podcast member of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the one you're listening to now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all the other podcasts at GunnaGeekNetwork.com and get ready because geekiness begins in three, two, one. Welcome to Just One More Fix. couple quick announcements before we get things started today. First off, just and again, I'm sure you guys are tired of hearing about it, but we will be at Game on January 27th from 2 to 6 for another Indie RPG Day, and I'm going to be running my PBTA Troubadours game about thespians, traveling traveling minstrels in the Shakespearean era, so like late 1500s, early 1600s. And Lacey is going to be there running something as well. We're not entirely sure what, but she is working on that as we speak. Right now. Right this very second. Right, <laughs> right on. <laughs> So that hope to see you guys there. That's January 27th from 2 to 6 at Game in Terre Haute. And badge registration for Gen Con opened up last Sunday at noon. So hopefully you guys, if you're looking to go to Gen Con, you can hop on there and get your badges. They haven't sold out yet, so we'll keep an eye on that and kind of let you know how things go with that. And the 27th, the Great Hotel Lottery for 2019 starts. So good luck to everyone in that. And... It starts at noon Eastern time on the 27th, so we'll see how that goes. Speaking of cons, Hoosier Con is coming up, and that's March 22nd to 24th, so we'll be posting the events that we are going to be running there very soon. So as soon as we have those posted, we will share those on the on our Facebook group and on Twitter for anybody that's interested in, in signing up for any of those games. I believe I'm going to be running Troubadours there and maybe some LOTFP stuff. We'll see what how that goes out, how that plays out. And Lacey's talking about some Tales from the Loop and maybe some Bluebeard's Bride. So we'll see. We'll see what uh, games we'll be we'll be running there. I'm not sure those may change. So I suppose we'll just see how it goes. <laughs> so you mentioned something from Third Eye Studios. Yes, uh, Third Eye Studios is starting what I believe is called an Oracle program. I want to say, uh, but basically. They are giving you swag for running their games at gaming stores and conventions. It kind of works like you run the game. You get like Like XP points points that you can spend on various sundry items. I haven't looked super deep into it, um, but I've been kind of following along as more news has come out about it. And if you like Third Eye Studios or if you haven't uh, looked into them yet, you know, check it out. And it might be something you're interested in partaking in. Well, so Third Eye Studios makes... Pip system, yeah. Pip system core book. Um, Part time gods. Oh, see now, I don't want to mess it up because I I'm pretty sure that all Eloy Lasanta stuff is through Third Eye Studios. Uh-huh. So that would be like Sins of the Father, um, Part Time Gods, um, anything from Pip System, so Mermaid Adventures, um, Infestation, uh, and then their core book, which is like Open System. He's he's done a lot of stuff, right? Well, so they have a pretty big spectrum of games too. So the in terms of tone and theme and crunch versus light crunch and that kind of stuff so uh check them out and you can uh maybe run some games at a gaming store because it's been a lot of fun for us and it's uh, get some free swag maybe uh for getting some games out there and stuff right on i think that's it for announcements other than this episode is coming to you a day late because the plague has hit our house and lacy has been kind of hoarse so this we're recording this a couple days late for us and it's going to be coming to you a couple days late but we still wanted to get something out to you this week and we had some cool ideas for this episode so we're excited for it and night witches should be dropping on this coming friday as well we are into the sixth session which that one was about four hours that was probably going to end up being between three and four episodes by the time it is edited and edited and done and we are recording another night witches episode or not episode session i should say on the 20th so lots of awesome and badness coming there i'm excited for it along the night which is vain our last episode was a one-on-one session with me and carrie 
uh, catching her character Vera up with the rest of the group. And if you haven't done any one-on-one gaming or anything like that, or you're looking for some examples of it, it turned into a pretty solid, strong episode. There was lots of tension and some really awesome things that happened. None of it involves combat. It's all just sort of dramatic moments and role play. And it's worth checking out if you want to see sort of in a short burst. It's about 20 minutes of actual role play of uh, building tension and one-on-one, uh, the way it, that kind of changes the uh, structure of the games and that kind of stuff. All right, so we're going to jump right into this one, and this one's going to work a little differently. In all the other Improving Fantasy Gaming episodes, we really just sort of talked very specifically about techniques and things to do, right? In the previous episode, we talked about how kind of like building characters and and building creatures and and ways to sort of make them more interesting. But in this case, there's lots of awesome characters and villains to draw from other media that you've seen out there, right? So one of the things we thought we might do is pick our favorite villains and that kind of stuff and talk specifically about what it is that they do and sources of inspiration to sort of draw into your games, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So I thought we might just, we, me and Lacey haven't talked about our list yet, so we might have some overlap. So if I mention one or you mention one um, and it's a different way, just go ahead and, you know, jump in there and sort of let me know. So I, I think I have one or two more than you, so I'm going to go ahead and start if that's all right with you. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start at the lightest end of the uh, of the mental uh, and like work spectrum, right? Mm-hmm. So my first two are Bellatrix Lestrange and the Joker. Oh, I almost picked picked Bellatrix, yes. but I did not. <laughs> <laughs> so it was close. Now, for me, they bring madness to the table, right? And that's a common trope that you see with a lot of your villains is just complete madness. You can't reason with these people; they are just crazy, right? And I think maybe Bellatrix Lestrange from Harry Potter, her crazy is at about an eight. And the Joker, his is at about a 12. So, you know, there's some self-preservation that exists in Bellatrix that doesn't necessarily in, in, uh, exist in the Joker. But if you think of the Dark Knight movie, that's probably one of the best crazy Jokers I've ever seen portrayed anywhere, whether that's on TV, in the comics, in movies, any of it, right? And there is a real... I guess what comes off to me is that when you tangle with these kind of characters... There's a certain amount of recklessness that they have that they're not going to back down from things and what repercussions that brings for you and how far they're willing to go to accomplish their goals. Doesn't matter what they break, doesn't matter what they destroy, they're they're all in all the time, every time. I would agree with that. Um, there are some differences, though. Um, like you said, like she's about an eight and he's about a 10. I think the difference there. I said 12. It was 12. 12. Sorry. He's, he's way off the chart. My scale goes to 10. <laughs> <laughs> my amps and my Marshall, it goes all the way. It goes mm-hmm, up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bellatrix serves someone else. Right. So she's at least bound in some kind of, I don't know if you want to call it a moral way, but some kind of lawful way, anti law. She don't, has she's some bound sense of loyalty. To Voldemort. It's more than a sense of loyalty because in the book, she's basically being held on trial, screaming to everybody that's giving themselves up, like, I will serve the Dark Lord, throw me in Azkaban as long as you want. He's oh, going wow. to reward me for my loyalty. Y'all are a bunch of these, take me to the jail. <laughs> like, <laughs> she's some next level loyal, but she does serve someone else. And that's um, something that's really interesting to me about the joke is that he has his own plan and his own agenda and it does not matter what anyone else in the entire world thinks like he is going to do his thing and he is not serving right. any kind of higher power mm-hmm. other than i don't know maybe if you buy into the chaos theory thing that maybe <laughs> potentially right. i could see him yeah, not but really. not really right you know he's very much doing his own thing he is his own master and completely unpredictable right so that's those are my thoughts on that. That's kind of why Bellatrix was pseudo on my list. It was more like, you know, <laughs> dying for the cause right. kind of. Well, and Plus I th- the other thing that's cool mm-hmm. about her is that she comes from a family of terrible people. Right. Uh, and, and <laughs> a long line and legacy of terrible yeah, people. And you see that in a, in a lot of um, fantasy things where it's, you know, like this is the house of well, so-and-so yeah. and that's in Harry Potter. So Born the house bad, black kind of. yeah. is all terrible people. Mm. And she is incorporated into that. She's like a some kind of cousin or something mm. to Sirius. But yeah, so she comes from a long line of just morally terrible individuals. Right. It's that born bad thing that exists where you have in a in a fantasy world, there's always generally speaking, there's a black and white kind of morality to things and being just 
innately evil is sort of one of those tropes that goes along with that. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot more to go into. Like, the, like we're going to distill these very complex characters down into some very individual elements because all the characters on my list are, for the most part, they're solid characters with multiple motivations and characteristics, but just want to distill them down into a um, – in a very specific way to when you see this character and you realize this is the purpose they serve, but they're still a very full character. Mm-hmm. Right. So I was going to lead with like my, my big bad awesome. But um, since you brought up Harry Potter, I'm going to go ahead and pick my Harry Potter villain that I chose. Uh, and it is not Voldemort. It is Wormtail. Which one is he? Is that Harry Tennant? David Tennant? No, not even close. He is the, the one kind that can of turn round into guy a rat. That's yes. kind of balding. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I like about him is that when whenever you're creating these NPC villains, you always want them to be super bad and like you know intelligent and overpower. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they have that certain aura of badness. Yes. Wormtail he exudes henchmen. He is. No, but he's not just a henchman because he's intelligent. Uh-huh. But he is a coward. He is the most cowardly character in probably the entire series of books. Uh And it's fascinating that he's able to do so much. In fact, he's so pathetic that they have the opportunity to kill him. And Harry is like, no, I just feel bad about this. (laughs) Right. Right. And um, you see this also with Gimli in Lord of the Rings. Not Gimli. Sorry, that's the dwarf. Um, Yeah. You know, Gollum Gollum, in Lord of the Rings. He's just... So pathetic, right. and and he's serving the evil almost out of a sense of fear as opposed to anything else mm. when it comes to Wormtail. And I I like the idea that maybe you know this character isn't impossible to physically overpower, but they're clever and um, they have this fatal flaw that can be used almost as a boon and, and something that you know once characters kind of get a hold of, if you make them interesting enough or make them an important pawn of the bigger picture, they're not just going to be killed outright because that's a problem too if you have yeah. somebody who's like yeah. well this could have been interesting but i killed them five <laughs> minutes ago while they were busy pleading for their life you know maybe right. you have this npc that you've created that falls upon the on the mercy of of your party paladin or something right. like please Throws i feet. can be better don't you know right. and then runs away the first chance they get you know <laughs> Well, my next one, I'm not sure where to go here. I've got quite a few. So I'm just going to go big real quick. I've got kind of three that combine into one thing, right? So I have the Witch King Angmar, Darth Vader, <laughs> and Smog all combined into one. Okay? Okay. Now... You're going to have to help me with how Darth Vader relates to Smog. I'm going to need some assistance getting it's there. It's real easy. Presence. Hmm. When Smog bursts from the mountain... And he unfurls his wings and all his way. Or actually, even before that. But some of that presence is is due to sheer size of right. dragon. I mean, I don't it's disagree. not like... I don't disagree. Or when, like, the, the gold coins slough off around him and you realize how big he is, right? There's lots of movies that I've seen with dragons. And that's the only one that I can remember where I was like, oh, my God, that's a dragon. But that doesn't give me a Darth Vader sense. No, but... At the so when you see him on the that screen, me and that, and that, star that giant eyeball <laughs> like kind of flickers, right? There's personality to it, is where I was going. So the, there's this just massive presence of dread that when you see something like this, you, you, oh no, here he is, right? And and Vader has that same effect when the doors open in the very first Star Wars and he comes walking through and everybody's shooting at him and all this kind of stuff. And he just walks through like, I'm Darth Vader, in case you didn't realize, and y'all about to die. And that good job with stark contrast in that shot, too, because everything in the scene is white white. except for him. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. It's just like this oppressive black shape (laughs) moving through. And he's so big and imposing and just fearless, and everyone is terrified of him, right? And same thing with Witch King Angmar when he is, or Agmar, when he is. On the battlefield, I think it's in Two Towers, before he gets killed, he's just laying waste to all these people. And he's huge and terrifying and the armor and the black cape, just like Vader. And all this kind of crazy, intense, powerful presence that just as soon as you see him. I think you should have picked Voldemort instead of Smog. I don't know. I th- and like lose the magic and the evilness. But it really. And the I wanted to mention. The- I wanted to mention smog because we talk dragons and big monsters and stuff. And very rarely have I ever seen something and been really impressed by how powerful or immense the, uh, their physical presence was. Right. And that's one of the only times I've seen it where I thought, oh man, like look at this thing. It's so big because like 
when Bilbo's in the frame with him and trying to move mm-hmm. around and they're climbing around the gold and stuff, that's one of the only times in a, in a movie where I've been impressed, like really, really impressed with the way they kind of presented their size or whatever. So it's just their sheer presence. As soon as they enter the scene, you know, this is bad. This is really, really bad. Like they're the ultimate level <laughs> of bad guy, right? When they have shown up, stuff has gone off the rails and you know it's time to either you know run away or try and figure something out contingency plans all this kind of stuff and to just think of those moments like think of the moment the very first time you saw in one of the star wars movies where where vader comes on screen and has this just you know even without even saying anything and just that sort of heavy breathing that he's got You're going like, first on first of all he's always kind of saying something <laughs> right <laughs> when, when as soon as his iron lung activates and and you hear him as soon as he walks on the screen and and that presence and you hear the breathing, you just know what's coming, right? And that's kind of what I'm going for here is that you should try and find a way for your villains that have this presence to find evocative ways to describe them so that when there are – well, I guess the breathing, right, The Vader has, you hear that. You don't. He's not even there yet. He's not even on camera, and you know what that means, right? Mm-hmm. The same thing – with uh, the screeching from the Witch King, right? And then Smog as the gold pieces slough away and you see this giant lizard eye blinking and you're like, oh no. That's that's the kind of thing you want to evoke, you know, for your big bad guy, right? That presence on camera I'm just presence. Thinking, like dragons are cool, right? Because it's not enough to like have the gold. Like I need you to bear me in the gold. That's how much I love the <laughs> right. gold. I need it right. touching all of my person. <laughs> I need at least 93% of my body being touched <laughs> right. by gold That's right now. That's weird to think about. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so I'm going to shift gears hard then from a big, ominous, single presence to um, a group presence. So in Neil Gaiman's The Graveyard Book, you have this guy who's a murderer, and his name is uh, – he's only ever referred to as the man Jack. Um, I guess at one point he takes on another idea, but it's always Jack something. Uh Um, And come to find out in the story, he's part of an order, the Order of Jacks. Okay. And so he's he's his own person, and yet he isn't. He's part of an organization that's all very uniform. It's almost like, okay, you remember in like V for Vendetta Mm -hmm. at the end, everybody has the masks on, and so it's kind of like they're all this thing. It's like that. So individually, he's terrible, and he's like a hired assassin, but he's part of this order of assassins, and it's all very secret society, Mm -hmm. secret organization working in the the backdrop of history. Like, there's a larger ominous presence that he is an anonymous portion of, and and so it's almost like he's part of a single organism. Mm Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Like I am Legion almost. Yeah. Like he's so nondescript as a person that you almost forget he's there, that Mm -hmm. kind of thing. And so, yeah, it's it's like Hydra is kind of like that in a way. Yeah, exactly. Very much like Hydra. I might have picked Hydra if I had thought about it. And so I think that's a cool thing if you look at it as creating a villainous NPC that is an organization. Right. And then everybody else is like a less important creature. And so the organization itself has its own drives and motivations mm-hmm. and, and ways of obtaining the things that they need. Right. Well, you're not fighting a person now. You're fighting an idea almost. Right. And how do you go about doing it's, that? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right on. I almost went with Mr. Tia Taime from uh, oh, yeah. Discworld. But the man Jack is like him, except with the organization thing also. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> All right, so my next one I'm going to go with is a big, a big change from Vader and the Witch King is Captain Barbosa from Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, nice. He's a good one. I like him. So it's Jeffrey Rush. So it's, I mean, it's Jeffrey Rush, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess he has a very big presence as well, but I kind of chose him more because he's sort of this fun loving bad guy. He's not wicked and terrible. I mean, he's not a good guy, right? But he's not wicked. He's not... He's believable evil. Yeah, yeah. Sort of self-serving in a way, really, right? But one of the things that I went with him for was, is he has this code, right? The pirate code. And at the end of it, he's like, ah, hang the code or whatever. But there is this specific code of things that he will and won't do. And these rules that he sort of lives and abides by, right? And he just... I guess it's two full, two pieces. One, he's fun, right? He, and and still is a bad guy. He's very clear, especially in the first movie. As the series goes on, it kind of changes and his character evolves. But in the first movie by itself, his character is fun and still believably bad, 
you mm-hmm. know, clearly a bad guy, selfish, out for himself or his crew, you know, but largely himself. And then he has this code of ethics while they might be skewed and self-serving and whatever, but he still abides by the rules of what it is. Right. And he, in with the fun thing, he's always poking fun at people. He's always poking fun at Jack. He has this history mm-hmm. with, with, with Jack Sparrow. And so he's always poking fun at him in the same way that you could have this character. If they've had a history with your with your players, there's moments where there's these inside jokes that can happen and he can kind of poke fun at them. And not in a way to sort of rile them up to get them to like attack him, but in those ways that I know you, you know me, and I'm gonna poke fun at you a little bit because mm-hmm. that's just what we do. You know, little little simple verbal jabs and that kind of stuff, you know, cracking jokes and and whatnot. And well, he has fantastic hats. So he does have fantastic hats. <laughs> you can't you can't go wrong there. And 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 pirates. And pirates a are yeah, monkey too. Pirates are fun and curses. You know, there's a lot of pieces to him, but um, I think it's an interesting concept to create a villainous NPC with uh, with a set of morals. And actually, mm-hmm. I mean, we talked about this a little bit with humanity when we were creating PCs, like setting an actual hard line of this is acceptable, this is not, and um, you know, consequences for what happens when you violate those things, right? Davy Jones is an interesting villain from that series yeah. too. Yeah, there's a lot of good characters in that show. They really, I mean. There's that was a, a mythological interest, though. You yeah, know, yeah, the yeah. Calypso and everything yeah. is. Uh, it's it's but it's backstory. it's well done, and they do a good job of of casting the right people for the right roles and and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of pieces to that. But Pirates of the Caribbean has lots and lots of inspiration. But pirates, awesome. <laughs> okay, uh, so so I'm gonna go with Cersei Lannister. Right on. So she is just uh, again, she's clever. Yeah. Right, but she's not afraid and she's i like powerful women in pcs and you don't see enough of them first of all so i definitely wanted her on my list but she has motivations that are very relatable on a human level her children it's yes. always her children yeah, yeah or you know sometimes jame too if she had yeah. to pick between the two it would be her children but or but jamie is on is on the list for mm-hmm. sure um her family her reputation right um the reputation of her house you know and so she's She's playing in in a man's world, and for the large portion of the series, she's winning at it. Mm-hmm. Um, and everybody eventually comes to a fall in George R. R. Martin's right. world, um, as it should be. And she has some very obvious weaknesses in yeah. Where she has flaws, they are big flaws. Yes, uh, and she's you know she's a little unhinged, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, and she's murderous. But she, I don't, but not just murderous. She is ruthless. Mm-hmm. Like if you are on her bad side, then that's it. I because the thing, I, one of the things I think is interesting about her is that if you're on her side and working for her, then she takes care of you in her own sort of oh yeah motherly lordly way, right? You know, she may not love you, but she will you know make sure you're paid and taken care of. But the minute you cross her, that's it. You are not on the A list. It's time for me to be just a terrible to you and be ruthless and well and that's part of the house too because house lannister always pays its debts yeah, that's yeah. their house motto right. and she takes her family's reputation very seriously right. and she feels like the other people that are still alive in her family are not showing it the same seriousness uh that it's due right. um you know because jamie is always just very much like you know la di da out gallivanting <laughs> and adventuring and right. then there's Tyrion, who everybody is like you shouldn't even be you know you're the terrible right thing well, it's one of those things but, where one of my favorite things with her is this sort of unrealized potential because it her potential is realized in a way because she's very successful at what she has done right but unrealized in the fact that she can't just overtly inherit everything mm-hmm. so she's always sort of trying to to do more because she can't Right. In that in that world, right? When within the parameters of how that's set up. So she's got this very kind of cool, always trying to play catch up in a way and, and the way that weighs on her personality. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I like about her and just uh in the the females in general is that she is an unapologetic villain. Yeah. Um, she's very much like, Yes, this is what I did and this is why, and if you ask me again, I'd do it a thousand right. more times. <laughs> Well, she's the, the interesting thing. And you thing. see that with like, with it's the same way, like I said, with Bellatrix Lestrange. Right. Um, she's the same way. Unapologetic. Right. This is what I did. I own it. And I would do it again. Mm-hmm. 
you mentioned the the motherhood thing, and I think it's interesting with Cersei because it's like that aspect of her turned all the way up, right? To mm-hmm. where not only is she loyal to her kids and willing to sacrifice for her children, she's willing to sacrifice everything and anyone for them. And it's, it, you know, it very clearly throughout the storyline, it gets out of hand a little bit. And well, she's without the same sympathies. So yeah. she knows what her weakness is, and she, she would appeal to someone else's same motherly instincts and emotions right. to get what she wants and at the same time turn around and kill that person's child yeah. in a blink of an eye right. if it served her purpose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. I hear she's a she's a uh a good character. And I think I think this show sort of develops the 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 finer points of her character a little bit more because you get to see it physically play out a little bit better mm-hmm. in a in a different kind of way. So Right on. Well, you mentioned a Lannister, so I will as well. So mine is Jaime because he is a character and a villain that goes on a journey. He, at the first book, you read about him and you think, oh, this guy is just the scum of the earth and there's no redeeming qualities in him. He killed the only man he's supposed to be protecting. He's sleeping with his sister. He pushed an eight-year-old boy out of a window. (laughs) Right. This litany of, of... just terrible acts and things that he's done, but that's not the end of his character. And I think it's interesting to consider your villains in that same sense. And that the if you have a long running campaign, the character and the villain, the the personality of the villain that they encounter in the first session, provided it's a long running campaign and this villain survives, should not be the same character that they meet at the end. I think there's a lot of potential in there for making sympathetic villains, which is essentially mm-hmm. kind of what he becomes throughout the series is you get to see a little bit more of his personality. And he changes as well. He's not a static character. But it's interesting to see that the journey he goes through and how he gets to where he is and then how does does he reconcile those two worlds? Because he's kind of stuck in a the momentum of his past keep pr- propelling him forward as a villain. But it's very clear that I to me at least that I don't think he wants to continue being this villainous Jane, you know, Lannister mm-hmm. that he that he's been for the majority of his life. And so that's sort of a game you kind of play and write out yourself with the NPCs that you make. But if you can find a way to have your characters have light shine on those moments, right? Then you can really show a full, complete personality of a character and and you might have some interesting um emotional connections and moments between the characters and this villain. Uh, as they learn about who they are a little bit more and, and have some sympathy for them. Maybe they've been through similar situations or whatever. And I think that that by the where the series has ended now, you realize that there are redeeming qualities in uh in Jame and how do you how do you reconcile that with the terrible person that he is and was, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and even if you don't go through that depth of character development with the NPC, uh, just another important thing you can take from him is that he is a villain that can be bargained with. Yeah. Um, he's very approachable. Uh, well, I, I, you know. I don't as, know about approachable. He's, he's very more pragmatic. approachable than Smog, you know. Yeah, yeah true. true. <laughs> or Darth Vader. But he, he's like, pragmatic and he realizes when he's sort of down on his luck and when he's been captured and that kind of stuff and he's willing to bargain and use the tools that he has, whether that's wealth or whatever. So he's somebody that you could fight, but he's also potentially somebody that you could win over to your side. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, I, I think NPCs, villain NPCs are interesting when they're not necessarily going to be fighting against you. Mm-hmm. Um, you go into that encounter, uh, and it's not assumed that, um, the physical combat is the way to go with that. Right. Or in the yeah. case of his interaction with Brienne, physical combat is where it starts. And then they go through this whole journey together. And then by the end of it, his loyalty is really challenged, whether it's to Cersei or to Brienne and the promises mm-hmm. that he made there. And what will he do? Their relationship kind of mirrors the one you see with uh, the Hound and Arya Stark. Yeah. It's similar in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. Well, the Hound is another one that I kind of wanted to put on my list, but didn't uh, just to keep it keep it abbreviated. But he's mm-hmm. a very complicated, villainous character that has a complicated past. And I guess that's really kind of where that kind of comes from is while going on a journey also, if you're going to do that and make it impactful, they have to have some kind of complicated past. He's got some of that bad guy presence too, more oh, than yeah. more than Jamie Lannister for yeah. sure. Um, he, yeah. He's got a little bit of that Darth Vader. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> With the helmet, the special it's, hound yeah. helmet is and that, yeah, that scowl that he has. So I'm going to switch gears then again. Serena Joy is from The Handmaid's Tale. I never saw the show, so I, I'm not going to say anything about the TV show. I know a lot of people may have seen it. Yes, I've read the book. Quick crash course in The Handmaid's Tale for people that don't know. It's kind of like this 
dystopian future? Yes and no. Um, it's it's almost more like a it, it it is, but it's more like a super religious compound. Okay. Completely cut off from the rest of the world, and in this, there are every woman is assigned a specific job, and that is their thing to do. So the women that wear red are responsible for giving producing children for the important men of the compound. Otherwise, sex is strictly forbidden. It is only for reproductive purposes. So there's this weird ritual that happens where the the man who wants a child and his wife are both in the same room with this woman who's supposed to give them a baby during conception. And it's all very much like, I'm looking at you, but I'm having sex with this other person. Okay. And she's supposed to carry the baby, basically. Okay. So the main character's name is Of Fred. Because you don't have your own name. You're of whoever the man's name is. So she is of Fred. Serena Joy is the commander, Fred. It's his wife. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, she is an interesting character because she is from before this compound is formed. And she was a, a televangelist actually, and so believed that everybody should go back to more traditional roles. So basically, she's campaigning for the suppression of every other woman, or sorry, oppression of every other woman in in the world. And right. this is how things should be done. And it ends up that she's not completely happy with her lot in life, and so she is kind of making everybody else miserable. Uh, and so <laughs> there's this terrible set of circumstances, and you read about it, and it's obviously... Nobody would want to live like this, right? right? But she's at least in some part responsible for the fact that things are this way now. And um, there's some some things going on with like the girl that was before of Fred um, hung herself before she came there. And if you don't produce a ba- a child within so much time, that's a viable pregnancy because right. infertility is a big problem. Then you're disposed of. You're considered not worthy. Right. Um, Basically, it's the the commander is infertile and his wife knows it. So she convinces of Fred to sleep with the like mechanic stable oh, boy, basically, okay. of the right. house. And she is like manipulating her. And but then she finds out she's having sex with her husband when they're not together and like outside of the ritual. And so there's this big thing. And, and she is trying to get her sent to jail for this. And, and so it's a big drama. But basically, um, she is a terrible villain because she's responsible for the, you know, partially for this terrible state of things in the compound. Plus, she's manipulating everyone around her. Um, Yeah. So that was my crash course in The Handmaid's Tale. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I was trying to bring it back around to why I really like her, but... um, I don't know. She's she's just she's very manipulative, and it, and it's interesting to see somebody working against something that even to her own detriment, because she doesn't like how things are now either. Mm. She's bored. She's not allowed to leave the house. She has to stay home all the time. You know, she can't have her own children. And <laughs> well, it's kind of interesting because you have. I don't. I mean, I've never watched or read the book or anything, but <clears throat> the way you talk about her is it's kind of like. Most villains are trying to break the status quo, and she's trying to maintain it, which is kind of a weird, a weird thing. Yes, uh, and and, when, and it's kind of like with Cersei Lannister too. It's like, okay, I'm stuck here, but at least I'm on top, right? You know, so I'm <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to try and make right. things any better, really, right? Um, as long as I get to stay up here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, so my next one, um, they're kind of two combining into one again. Uh, there, I realize they're kind of different characters, but. The first one is uh, Dolores Umbridge from mm-hmm. Harry Potter. I almost picked her too. She's so I like. I just hate her. That, <laughs> the I was, core of my being. Yeah, I was. We're thinking reading about, about this. her right now because we're reading the Order of the Phoenix <laughs> and we're on her chapter right now. Right on. So there have not been many characters where not I see them on the screen and I'm just like, God, I hate that person. <laughs> you know, and yeah, she is definitely like you know Joffrey. <laughs> from yeah. from Game of Thrones is one of those people, and so is she. And I just see her, and she's just she's wicked. She is just a terrible person, and she's brutal, and she's punishing, and she's manipulative, and she's so nice about it. 
you know? Well, she's not, though. She's not nice. Well, she has this nice veneer to everything that she does, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, this, like, covered politeness. In polish. Yeah, yeah, she's very polite about everything that she does. And she's just a terrible person. She she's a good example of bureaucracy as evil. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? She reminds me a little bit of Prince John in Robin Hood, where he's like, <laughs> I'm going to raise the taxes twice as many taxes." you know, like she's right. a good like political villain because um, she's another person where she's probably clever. And so if you if if you caught her in a fight, she may have you at an advantage there. But as far as actual physical prowess, it doesn't right. seem like that would be her thing. No. You know, she's tricky and mm-hmm. uh Political influence is an interesting thing. Right. Uh, well, she's just a good – she has a sort of disarming look to her in a way, mm-hmm. but is very clearly not on your side. And along the same sort of wicked witch idea, and I have uh, Janice from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Winter Queen. Janice? That's what they said her name was online. J-A-N-I-S. Hmm. But it's it's the Winter Queen from the Land the Witch in the Wardrobe. Yeah, the the Snow Queen. Yeah, the Did Snow we call Queen. Her the yeah. Winter Queen. I, I can't remember. Snow, I think it's the Snow Queen. So, but she enslaves a ton of people. She subjugates those that aren't that that sort of don't. So those that don't fall in line are, are enslaved, mm-hmm. and those that or do turned to stone. Are, yeah, or petrified, and those that do are just sort of subjugated and, and subservient to her, and sort of changing the world around her and bending the world to her will but um, under the guise of law and order right it's almost it's it's almost like it's like it's nazi like really it's yeah. it's totalitarian mm-hmm. um fascist government oh, yeah. as a bad guy so like there and it's too like the method is the same right the goal is the same the way they get there between umbridge and and the and the snow queen are the same but the way they go about it is drastically different, you, you know? Mm-hmm. And just the – well, she has a, a disarming presence as well. She has this sort of white winter dress thing going on and she's uh, – at least in the in the movie, it's Tilda Swinton and who do, is not an imposing physical figure. She looks sort of disarming and, you know – don't don't have to worry about me. She's nice and polite. All this guy, at least at the beginning of things, right when things are going right, which is sort of very similar to to Umbridge as well, right? She's polite, and then when she you get brought back in the office, then well, you see um, how bad she is. Very interesting too, because she is wearing this like pink sweater yeah. all the time, <laughs> right. um, and everybody else is in these like voluminous robes, mm-hmm. and, and she's you know got this hat and this pink outfit, and is is even. In her shape, you know, she's, she's, she's corpulent, I guess. Right. I don't know how Poorly, you, however. how you want to say it. Um, but compared to say like the, the stark features of Snape, uh-huh. you know, when you compare it to her, she looks very much more approachable, um, but is every bit as dangerous, if not more so. Right. Uh, and, uh, the idea that evil is actually order taking way too far is sort of the right. opposite of the joker right <laughs> right <laughs> chaos too far or order too far <clears throat> they're very different but very similar in some kind of a way right this disarming force of order that's not going to be stopped in any way mm-hmm. and and it's an interesting idea that you can take any sort of motivation and stretch it to the extreme to make an NPC. So right. it doesn't always have to be, I'm going to kill and murder everyone. No, no. You know, you can take any motivation and just draw it out as far as possible mm-hmm. uh, to, to create the, the goals for uh, a villain. Right on. So yeah, those are, those are my two sort of wicked evil people, but not overtly so, right? <clears throat> like they very clearly are once you see what they've done, but at the beginning, mm-hmm. It doesn't come across that way. They're sort of disarming and, oh, it's just anti-whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And her um, sort of gradual overtaking of things is yeah. good, too. As you see, you know, she kind of tests the waters and then mm-hmm. you get a little more and a little more right. and a little more, as fascism does. But <laughs> <laughs> So my last one, the big bad Dracula. Oh, right on. He had to be on the list somewhere. I thought about it. I didn't, though. Is he a fantasy character? I don't know, but there are vampires in D&D, so I feel like it's good. (laughs) Right on. He's obviously a good villain because uh, since Bram Stoker, there's been dozens, if not hundreds, of (laughs) different takes on Dracula. Dracula. Yeah. But let me talk about the things that I like from the book specifically. 
Again, he's incredibly intelligent, but he is arrogant. He's very much, a you know, thinks that he is, cannot be defeated. He has superpowers. I mean, <laughs> basically that's what it is. But he has another interesting weakness that is pretty cool, and it's his anachronism. Right. Um, so he needs Jonathan Harker at the beginning because he doesn't really understand, and he keeps yeah. telling him, you know, I'm, I'm not from England. I don't understand how the things work there. Like, mm -hmm. I've always been from, you know, the, you know, Romania, Transylvania kind of area, um, and, and so I don't really get how Europe works. And so he keeps him hostage in this very, like, polite guise <laughs> until he can garner enough information, and he's... He finds out that when he's asking him questions about his business affairs, he's doing it in a way so that he's not really asking him a question like you would ask your accountant. He's asking a question like you would ask somebody when you want to learn how to do it yourself. Right. Like, okay, so let's say maybe I have something I don't want person A to know about, but I need to get it delivered. Can I do this? Right. You know, and then he's like, oh, yeah, okay. And so Jonathan Harker kind of figures him out, but by then he's already gone and he, you know, he moves on. And, of course, he has another very obvious weakness in that he has to feed on human blood. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that, you know. <laughs> you know, he can't, can't go without. But he is powerful in a way that you can't just approach him and have a fight and expect no. to win. Yeah. He's somebody you have to dedicate resources and planning to. And he's also... He's almost similar to me in, in the way that Smog is. Um, so he's not imposing in the same way. He certainly is because he has this charismatic mm -hmm. sort of presence that's an awe, if you will, I guess, majesty, maybe mm. you would call it right. if you were doing White Wolf. But size-wise, he's not the same as Smog. But he is, in in his setting, there are no other supernatural things in that book other than him. Right. Um, and he is so incomprehensibly bad that the people in the local village cross themselves whenever you mention him. Right. <laughs> uh, they don't go out after dark. They don't travel this exists. trail. Yeah. They pray for you when you go that direction. Like it, <laughs> they give you crosses and, and things to, to help protect you and keep right. you safe and try and convince you, please, for the love of God, don't go there. <laughs> so he does have this, this presence to him, but he's also on a different power level. And sort of beyond comprehension, because there's nothing else in that time period, like it's set in this very historical sort of place where there aren't other terrible things. There mm -hmm. is only him. And so if you're used to this world where everything is normal and then you have this big, terrible thing, he's just, you're not really sure what he's capable of. Like, right. And and so a, a physical encounter without lots of planning and lots of assistance and foresight and all of this. It's completely out of the question, but he's also not, I'm not going to say human, but he is, you know, of human intelligence. And so it is possible for at least a certain amount of time to bargain with him. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to have something he wanted or could get him something else that he wanted, there's definitely the option there that you could try and deal with him. And so you see that in, um, in like Knights Black Agents, right? Where um, the Dracula dossier, mm -hmm. <laughs> like the the British folks have decided it would be a good idea to try and recruit him <laughs> right. as an undercover like right. agent asset or something. Right. They're like, what a terrible idea. Right. But would it be possible? Mm, if you could justify, you know, the ends to him in some way. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> um, the other thing that's cool about him that is not, true of any of the other NPCs that I mentioned, except for maybe the organization thing, because it kind of evolves anonymously, right? Is that he's beyond time. Right. Transcends time, which changes everything. Yeah. Well, before I do my last one, I know we haven't mentioned yet, but probably bears mentioning here is Snape. And there's probably a lot of you out there saying all these we Harry Potter references about, this beforehand. <laughs> uh, about Snape, but Snape is going to... I'm surprised he's on your list because you fought me so hard about him well, being no, no, no. a good guy. He's, he's not on my list. I just want I think it bears mentioning that we're going to do an entire episode about making NPCs that can kind of mirror that level of complexity and that kind of stuff. But he is not my final one. But I just wanted to mention it because there's probably a lot of people screaming about how, how could you not have Snape? How could you not have Snape, right? So we are going to have Snape, but in a, a different kind of context. Because I think we could probably do 
a year's worth of these episodes and not cover all the amazing villains that exist out there. My last one is Magneto. Oh, man, he's a good one. Magneto, like a lot of these other villains we have, he's well, he's a full developed, fully developed character, right? And he also benefits from the fact that Ian McKellen played him. And I can't recall the new guy's name, name that plays him in the first class series, but he does an amazing job as well, right? But he has a tremendously complicated history, right? So he's not someone who was born bad, but you have this play on that trope where he's going to very clearly, because of the trauma that he goes through uh, during World War II in the concentration camps, that he very clearly becomes bad, right? He's not going to go through anything like that again. And the reason why I picked him is, of all the bad guys that are out there, he is the one that I see that has a purpose. And not a purpose like, I want to destroy the world, I want to rule the world. He has a purpose that he sort of views as benefiting the entire world. This is the next stage the world is supposed to go through. You either get on board, or you go away. Right. Mm -hmm. And he has he has such a powerful message to people that are mutants. Right. Like being from the United States, the idea of the concept of freedom. Right. Is such a powerful thing that's like ingrained in your Uh in your core. Personal sovereignty, all this. So you could see how if you were selling that message to someone who is that oppressed Mm -hmm. that it would be successful. It's a little scary. Well, <laughs> well it's crazy. So he, he's one of the most powerful villain, or not villains, one of the most powerful mutants that exists in that sort of world, right? And he's terrifying because there's iron everywhere, right? He's basically just a walking god in some kind of a way because of what he's capable of doing. But I don't. that's not what makes him scary to well, me. you say his power level like that, but it depends on where you find him. And so that's an important point, I think, with evolution, too, is that as you're characters are leveling up it makes sense that your npc would get stronger too oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and he definitely does right well he develops his abilities as time goes by but his his mutant powers aren't what makes him the cool villain that i that i see him to be it's it's more this this drive that there are people that are just incredibly driven to accomplish things and and build things and do things. And that seems to be that sort of archetype that he fits into, right? So he's going to build this league of, uh, of, um, not league. I don't think ambition is enough either because he's very charismatic as well. He's well-spoken, well put together, Mm -hmm. you know, even as Ian McKellen, you know, like he's an old guy, but like, I would say in that role, like he's even attractive Uh and it may be like just the power that comes with it or a certain presence, but Confidence, I guess, is what mm-hmm. it is. And that kind of goes along with the ambition. But yeah, he's lots of charisma. Right. <laughs> and with him, along with this incredible drive that he has, right, there's this history that he has with with Xavier. And while I'm not a big fan of Xavier as a character, he acts as sort of like a foil to um, bring out the aspects that you want to see in Magneto, right? And... Oh, I love Xavier. He's neat, but... I just don't think he's as compelling of a character as Magneto. I just don't, especially (laughs) when you watch the the scene with Kevin Bacon in first class where he's trying to draw the rage out of out of Magneto's character with his mother there in the concentration camp and everything. And you see the sort of the history and the trauma that that Magneto has gone through and then him trying to restart a life with with the woman that he falls in love with and everything and that getting taken away from him and just sort of having this terrible list of tragedies that that are his life and how that drives him to never be in that position again and then also sort of like while he's a bad guy and he's clearly in the storyline he's a villain he's also i i would argue a hero in a lot of ways as well though because the reason he does these things is to liberate all of these people that could very easily get put on some kind of a registry and all this other kind of stuff that they go through in that storyline that is a very real possibility. And he's doing this out of an altruistic sense to protect people because of what he's gone through, right? And he doesn't want any of them to go through what he goes through. And there's this sort of moral dilemma that's happening in the background. Now, he he doesn't have the dilemma because he is driven and knows what he wants. But in the background of the entire story, you see how that that sort of that moral math is done and, and where is it right and where is it wrong? And that's, he's, he's one of the most complex characters when you really break down his motivations and look at his history and all that complexity just 
pushes more towards why he's so driven to do this, right? And he just is never going to be dissuaded. So, like, Cersei's driven, right? But not in the same way that he is. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, that is just, it's just never going to stop. And he's always going to find more people. No matter what you do or who you kill around him or what happens, no matter what the, the cost of the fight, he's always going to continue because that's what he, he's a true believer in a sense, right? Mm. He's very pragmatic. Yeah. So he's he's my last one. I think he's just wicked awesome. He's just he's just an awesome, awesome character. So do you have any quick honorable mentions just by character name that you thought of or no? Um We mentioned the hound already, kind of. I thought about uh Zorg. <laughs> yeah, from, from Fifth, Fifth Element. Element. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's another yeah. interesting, um, definitely can be bought sort right. of villain, you know. I think it's interesting, like I didn't really think of a lot of the people from Lord of the Rings. Because Gollum is really kind of the most interesting villain to me the yeah. rest of them are, are a little bit flat honestly he kind of floats back and forth between villain and uh, but it's hard to say because lord of the rings is so old yeah it's not when it same. comes to fantasy literature that like those ideas may have been new then but like yeah, now i've seen way. them a bunch of times so right. um they just seem a little less interesting but uh, i think you're the the wraith kings are probably the second most interesting right. you kind of kind of pulled on them so kitty r is one i would mention from dragonlance she has a very complicated <laughs> history with the heroes, I only like read the young, first book, so. young being young and being in love, you know, with a cut with one of them or whatever, makes for an inter- interesting backstory that happens. I thought about Lestat. Oh yeah, um, he's very much the villain in Interview with the Vampire, mm-hmm. uh, and that's well done. Blair Armand is not a bad one either. He's in there. Mm-hmm. Oh, I did. Uh, I guess honorable mention to uh, the guy in Jurassic Park. <laughs> that's played by the mailman from Seinfeld. I can't uh, think of his uh, name right now. Yes. Uh, uh, oh my uh, God. I hated that guy so much when I was younger. Like why, why? But greed, greed, <laughs> greed. is such a powerful motivator yeah. and it's a good, uh, good villain motivation. It is the only <laughs> sin. In fact, I, I think greed is, <coughs> it's always greed. All right. So there are just a giant list that goes on and on of other villains and characteristics to draw from them. So we may do another one of these somewhere in the future, maybe a sci-fi focused one or something. I don't know. But these are just a few of our of our personal favorites and, and their qualities. And one thing that I will mention to do beyond just making characters that are built like this, right, kind of came to mind with me while I was prepping Hot Springs, is that there are lots of different villains and bad guys in, on the, in Hot Springs Island, but they all have their own sort of political motivation. So sort of... In, you you make these awesome bad guys and their organizations and whatnot. And then if you go back to, I think it's uh, Building Vampire Games, uh, number two, where we talk about how we sort of structure a vampire game for a political style thing. And there's competing loyalties and everyone is at each other's fro- throats for different reasons. And these two hate this person but get along with this other one. And that can really sort of develop the your world out into a little bit more f- uh, into a little more full universe for your players to sort of uh, wander around in and explore so they don't just have one main big bad guy that they're always running up against so now we we killed bad guy A who's the next big bad guy that we go up against right there's always a couple different competing bad guys for what's happening and it makes just gives the players interesting choices that may surprise you and it sort of makes less work for you because once you've built this world, then they just sort of get to play around in it and then you just sort of react to what they're doing. So, yeah. So don't just think of individual villains. Think about how they sort of multiple villains in a world interact with each other, right? Oh, uh, I was going to mention when it comes to villains in the Vornheim book, and I know this is not a, an original idea, but it's just where I saw it and I'd heard it before and it just, um, I had forgotten about it. But the idea of God's chess where um, you play chess or something similar, a similar game where pieces are left on the board. And so it's um, competing factions. And um, as the pieces are left, that's a representation of what is going on in the world at large. So like if you were doing a vampire game and you played chess between the Sabat and the Cam, um, let's say the the white team has a, a bishop left. So that would represent some kind of um, influential church member or organization that they have at a certain point Um control over or if you had knights perhaps that would represent uh the police organization uh and so then you would play out an entire game and then look at what was left over uh and who was in the lead and that would give you an idea of the political pull of the world right home all right well i think that'll do it for us so quick gunny geek promo for all things good and nerdy episode 343 this is all elite the boys are back this week to run down the latest geeky happenings 
Anthony has the details of a rumored Lady Sif show coming to Disney. Willie recaps the rumored cancellation of the remaining X-Men movies. And Chris is returning to the pro wrestling fandom with a launch of All Elite Wrestling. And you can check them out. That is All Things Good and Nerdy, episode 343 on the Gun and Geek Network. Well, that'll do it for us. Hopefully you guys can use this to make some more full NPCs and uh, sort of a bigger, better, brighter, or darker world for your characters to interact in. It's gray. I prefer gray. gray. World. A gray world. Right on. <laughs> and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. This has been an episode of Just One More Fix. Music has been provided by Kevin McLeod. You can find him at Incompetech.com. You can support us at Patreon.com slash Just One More Fix or follow us on Twitter at Just One More Fix. <laughs>